Burlington, Vermont was chartered in 1763 and settled in 1773. It has maintained status as largest city in the state, aided by the fact that it sits directly on Lake Champlain, once a major waterway used for commerce. Industrial development in Burlington centered near the waterfront and the railroad tracks that ran parallel to the shoreline. Within walking distance to these waterfront employers, the large corridor between Church Street, the city's main retail district, and the waterfront became residentially populated, including many small family businesses. In the 1950s, suburbanization and reduced railroad and lake trafficking threatened Burlington's economy. Other U.S. cities were experiencing similar problems, but on proportionately larger scales. Many began to institute downtown revitalization plans, including redevelopment of dilapidated areas. The federal government, in the Housing Act of 1954, offered financial assistance to municipalities engaged in redevelopment planning, giving birth to the term urban renewal. Theoretically, improved economic health in targeted areas would provide the federal government and the municipality with more tax revenue. However, prior to receiving federal funds, the designation of urban renewal project areas as slum and blighted was required. As more and more U.S. cities jumped on the urban renewal bandwagon, debates opened up in neighborhoods across the country. Residents of project areas defended the quality of their homes while city governments yearning for federal assistance eligibility condemned them. The urban renewal chapter in Burlington's history book had begun. The um, Champlain Street urban renewal project started back in the late 50s in Burlington. The first city vote on it happened in 1958 under Vermont statutes, uh, the citizens of Burlington had to vote that uh, slum and blight existed in the community. The city set up an area of 27 acres, which uh, basically was involved with the land on the west side of uh, Battery Street, then going up uh, College Street, uh, then turning north on Pine Street, up to um, St. Paul Street, and then back down Cherry, and then over to Pearl Street and back down to, uh, to Battery. And I had friends and schoolmates that lived in the project area. My father had his medical office uh, on Cherry Street in the project area. I knew and took care of real estate uh, for the family in the project area and lived there while I was uh, going to St. Michael's College. So I had a personal association, I think, with the area itself. 157 families and 67 individuals lived in the project area. More than 40 of the families had lived in the area for more than five years, and approximately 14 families had lived there more than 20 years. Well, I, I was born on 12 Cherry Street, and it was a home that my dad built with some of his Italian friends. And I'll tell you, there was not a sturdier house on that street. It was very simple, very plain, but that house had 12 rooms in it, of course, the 12 kids, why not, you know? Uh, and we enjoyed every minute living there. As a matter of fact, we lived there 51 years before I moved to North Avenue, where I've been 30 almost. Now, I don't care where I go today, we can start talking about where we live right now, but by the time the conversation is over, we're right back there on Cherry Street. It was a two-story, uh, an older house, my dad bought it back, uh, I believe, in the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, lived there with my parents and my grandparents. My grandparents were also in the, in the residence. My dad was uh, city treasurer for the city of Burlington uh, for 19 years. Uh, my mother was a policewoman, uh, the second policewoman in the uh, city of Burlington. And I'm presently the, uh, the fire chief of the city of Burlington. And I've been in the fire service for the uh, city for the past 30 years. So there's a history of uh, city service, if you will, and uh, quite proud of it and quite proud of the family that I came from. 
I'm standing on the spot where my house would have been. It was 84 South Champlain Street, and it was in the back of 82 South Champlain Street, which my grandmother owned. 82 was a big Victorian style 20 room house that had originally been a family home with my grandparents and my mother and all her sisters. Uh, but then it had been cut into four apartments. And that whole location was between College Street on the south and Bank Street on the north. Right now, the, the spot is the Chittenden Bank. I'm standing in the Chittenden Bank's parking lot. Well, I lived at uh, 81 South Champlain. It was between college and uh, bank. And I lived there from when I was born till I was 18 years old. And I just, you no, know, I remember growing up there as a kid, having a lot of good times and playing on the waterfront. I. Uh, Learned how to cut hair there from my father. Across the road from us, there was a bakery shop, Moquin's Bakery. And, uh, you know, the, there was uh, the Moquin family there, and they all worked in the bake shop. Well, we lived at 86 South Champlain Street. Uh, I, was about, I was about seven or eight when we moved there. Um, my grandfather acquired the land the house, it was a brick, a red brick house, uh, and he acquired the house and the building next door, which he um, made a bakery out of, Mother Mulquin's Bakery, where my mother and four, all her four brothers worked there. It was a family thing. That's the way it was in those days, you know? The project area also consisted of 41 businesses. Some served as local gathering spots, blending seamlessly into the neighborhood landscape. You had everything. You had, uh, you had the churches. You had grocery stores. You had gro a little private grocery stores, but it satisfied every. You had the Cory grocery store, Marola's Market. You had everything right down. Eisel's just two blocks away. You had Reedy Funeral Parlor. Reedy did a lot of business back then, but it was close by. They didn't need a car to go every place. They had the hospital straight up the hill. They, uh, everything was there. That, that was uh, a strong neighborhood. Everybody knew everybody else. Uh, they had, there was body shops, automotive people that work on cars. It was all these kinds of things in that, in that neighborhood. There was a place on Battery Street called the Wagon Wheels. I don't remember how many people remember that, that bar. Uh, but as a teenager, we would go in there after dancing the country dances up in the countryside. Then we hung around Marola's store all the time. We used to go there about every night. We'd all go up to the corner and we'd get ourselves a, a Coke and we'd sit there and tell stories and talk about sports and trade baseball cards. When we were having Italian food in my house, my mom would send me up for their cheese and they'd hand grate the cheese in this little hand grater. He'd put a chunk in and grate it and it was out of this world. Back then, customers and friends were, were the same thing. And you know, it was some meaning for a business to have this kind of relationship. As word of a pending urban renewal project echoed through the city, the labeling of the designated area as a slum came as a shock to the people who lived there. When I first heard that they were calling uh, that area a slum, it, it, it probably took me back a little bit. Uh, because quite frankly, I remember the Champlain Street area as not being a slum. I think we were in a nice neighborhood with all hardworking people and businesses, and uh, I never considered it a slum. There was no way for the um, city to expand. Um, couldn't go east because of the row of churches and the residential area that was a pretty good residential area. Um, so the only real choice they had was to look at this 27-acre parcel. There were um, 66 properties that were very bad, and the balance had some degree or other of uh, problems that needed to be solved, whether it was having a three-piece bathroom or internal heating or uh, water in some instances. But intermixed with that were some just some great, wonderful houses that were very well kept, uh, some families that lived there for generations upon generations. The good condition buildings were sprinkled throughout the whole area so that you couldn't say, okay, we're going to take this one block and, and uh, rehabilitate it and, and, and do the number and the balance of it. Um, and there was a critical mass issue for 
having enough developable area to allow the commercial expansion. So the project was not really one that uh, lent itself for rehabilitation. They had to say the things they had to say about that Cherry Street and that it was a slum area because they had to get this project through. Otherwise, they would never have gotten it through. Burlington voters approved urban renewal in March of 1963, including a $790,000 bond measure that would be matched by 2.4 million federal dollars to assist with redevelopment. You had six wards of the city of Burlington voting for it. The only one in Ward 5 didn't vote for it, but all the other wards, well, of course, it wasn't affecting these people. It wasn't affecting their pocketbook. There wasn't any increase in property tax. Why? Because the, the government was running it all. The federal involvement was that it's, if you cut down on slum and blight and its causes, the dollar that has to be spent in social services reduces. So from a long-term investment standpoint, there's some benefit. There's also benefit in decent sanitary housing. The vote acted as notification to residents of the project area that they would eventually have to vacate their homes and businesses would have to relocate or shut down. My grandparents would have a habit of uh, talking in French to each other when they didn't want us to understand what they were saying. And so that day that I walked in and they were in the kitchen talking French, I knew something was going on. And finally I asked and they said it got passed. It looks like sometime down the road. We don't know when we'll be, we'll be all moving. They wanted my father to go on North Burlington. And it was a, a, where they had a lot of apartments and they wanted my father to buy that. And my father said, no, where am I going to put my trucks? He said, no, I'm just going to go without the business. My father, you know, he was quite upset. Uh, he was at that time probably in his late 40s, early 50s. And it was a big shock, you know, because his home was there and his business was there that he had built for years. And, and you know, it was it just disrupted his whole life at, when he was about ready to start thinking about getting done. I think the city's um, approach um, in the operation of this project was to try and be as helpful as possible to the people that were in the project area, whether they're business people or individuals or families. That's a very tough situation. Three years passed between voter approval and the first building demolition. The city spent this time planning, acquiring properties, and instituting relocation efforts. A study was completed that projected redevelopment tax revenue at $250,000, six times the current $41,000. And the Riverside Public Housing Complex was constructed to house displaced urban renewal residents. A person living in urban renewal, uh, an elderly person, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I was told today that, like Mrs. Nana, she lived on Champlain Street for a year. She was about 62 years old, and she had a house, and uh, it was all paid for. It was all paid for, and uh, for her living there with her eight kids, uh, there was no expense. But to relocate her, put her in another house where she accumulated a mortgage, and she had to pay for that. Fred and Isabel Moquin had to start like newlyweds with a home and a mortgage. And you know, when you're in your 60s, that's when you should be thinking of retiring. retiring and not having so many bills and having a mortgage paid for, having a party with the family, burn the old mortgage papers. My Aunt Catherine had to go out into the new developments in the new North End. She went out to Village Green and made a down payment with this money and ended up at 60 something years old having a mortgage to carry. It, it, was, pretty, it was pretty upsetting for an awful lot of people. They just walked in, told us you had to move, and that was it. Well, with a family of seven, I wasn't about to jump at their first choice. Uh, they tried to put me in places that were worse than urban renewal. And I told him when I found a place that was compatible for my kind of, of uh, income, from the things that I had to do for my children, the location for where they had the easiest to get to school, that's where they were going to find, that's where I was going to move to. 
I think that one of the most difficult things to do is to have to give up uh, land that, or, or property that, you, that you've had in your family. Uh, I don't know that it matters that it's been there for 100 years or 10 minutes. It's, it's your property and now uh, for the public good you have to give it up. Uh, I think I'm going to be bitter about it if I had to do that. We were acquiring the buildings but could not demolish the buildings until we had a developer under contract. And the first firm that uh, proposed a high-rise apartment complex on uh, Pearl Street, along where today the St. Paul's high-rise uh, uh, apartment complex is, was a Vermont firm called Horizons Incorporated. Horizon made it clear very early on that that our interest was uh, one to to um, help in any way we could to keep the downtown core alive, to keep it vital. Uh, turn the city around uh, 180 degrees so that it would be looking at the lake rather than away from uh, that lake. We felt that if uh, people started looking at the lake that it would start cleaning that waterfront up. Urban renewal made the transition from planning to reality with the demolition of the first home in the area on May 17, 1966. Nearly eight years after the first mention of urban renewal, a home owned by Frank and Stella Marola at 27 through 33 South Champlain Street was torn down. We'd come back for holidays and I'd see that another block was taken and another section and it, it was pretty miserable to see it all. And by then they had put everybody out of their homes. They had taken over all the properties and boarded them up and then started to knock them down with bulldozers. Sooner or later, it was all like it was all leveled and it was like a desert down there. You could see the, the Adirondacks right across the lake. In July of 1966, two months after demolition began, 150 residents still lived in the project area. That same month, one-third of the people from whom the city had already purchased land appealed to Chittenden County Court for more money. However, the appeals process was a bit of a gamble. If the court ruled on a lesser value than what had already been paid, the difference would have to be paid back to the city. The prices that were initially uh, given to the people that owned their homes were for the most part extremely low and, and many of the families uh, were outraged and ended up uh, going to court. But even going through the court process, it's my recollection that what they came out with was certainly far less than what the property was, was valued at. They said, you weren't gonna lose any money. They were gonna relocate you at their cost. They were gonna give you something comparable to what you had and it was gonna be no expense on you. What we could pay and did pay for the homes were based on two professional appraisals done by members of the American Institute of Real Estate Appraisals, appraisers. Um, the commission, planning commission adopted a policy that they would pay the highest price that they could substantiate by an appraisal. We hired a review appraiser to recommend to the commission what was fair market value if, if the review appraiser felt that uh, the appraisals were low, he would say so, and we would go back to the, the person uh, with this information and try and adjust the appraisals. In some of the instances where I was personally involved with, knew the people and knew what they received for their property, I, th I think they felt, I felt that, that they were getting a pretty good deal. Uh, there was others that, that just did not want to be relocated. And when you're in your house for 40 or 50 years, uh, what's proper compensation uh, if you don't want to move, if you just don't want to be relocated? Uh, in today's society, uh, as we did it today perhaps, uh, the courts would be looking at it in a vastly different area. Uh, but at that time, it was, uh, it was rubber stamped, it was a done deal. The former residents of the project area weren't the only ones experiencing difficulties. It was a federal office in New York City that didn't believe high-rise apartment complexes would go in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, that was their difficulty. We finally got the feds turned around, but it was almost too late for this firm to benefit from that. We saw 
the Champlain uh, Street project built on a platform, a platform at the level of, uh, of Pine Street. That platform uh, would create an area similar to, I won't say, as, as equal to the space at St. Mark's in Venice. The entire community wasn't together uh, on the project, and that uh, there were uh, different uh, groups that wanted pieces of it, um, different pieces segment the project, and that's what, that's what happened is that it got segmented. They were given two or three extensions of time to try and accomplish what they were uh, trying to accomplish. We were figuring out how did the city ever get anything out of this because here it was all dormant. It was, there was nothing down there. The land was all empty. There was nothing being built. It seemed to be expedient to the Planning Commission to default us since we didn't meet what they considered to be, you know, the kinds of, uh, having the kinds of uh, collateral uh, that they were looking for. Uh, and, I, and I think that they understood uh, an awful lot of the problems that the developer horizon was having in, in attracting uh, uh, companies to come in and settle in the, in the renewal area. I uh, worked very hard to try and get the commitments that they needed at the federal level. was able to, in the 11th hour, uh, get a commitment, but it wasn't enough to, to bring that to a um, positive situation. What could we do? Uh, to, to show that this project, after tearing down all these houses, means something, that it is going to go ahead. So in one hand, they were looking for quick fixes. In other hands, they, in, other, in another hand, they were hoping that we could get the long view. And Horizon didn't have the capacity to give them quick fix, fixes. It, it just couldn't do it. Despite the fact that the city had no developer under contract, demolition continued. Then, in December 1967, construction began on the first new building in the area, the Pearl Street State Office Building and Courthouse. Although no taxes could be derived from this structure, redevelopment had begun. Two months later, the city signed a contract with a new developer from Atlanta, Georgia. Again, the project could move forward, two years after demolition began, except for one problem. One family still lived in the project area, and they refused to leave. As you look down through uh, that particular area and that vast expanse of nothing, uh, after a long period of time, uh, my best recollection was the Dutra Ponderosa still standing after everything else was gone. And it still stood for, I believe, maybe two or three years after the, the expanse was completely flattened of everything else. As I say, I was the last one to leave uh, because uh, I wasn't about to take their word for whatever. They could call it anything they want, but they were all wrong. She did not want to move. Oh, she fought them all the way. And I thought, this is a grand lady. I really did because you'd see her on TV or you'd hear about it on the radio or the free press. She'd be splashed all over her pictures and she'd defy them and she'd stand there and tell them, this is my home and you're not taking my, I'm going, boy, if we all got together, if the neighborhood got together and we, if we did that, maybe we'd still be here today. One night was on a Thursday. I looked up and there this big guy was standing in the doorway. And I said, yeah, what can I do for you? He said, well, I'm the troubleshooter for Art Hogan and Herbal Renewal. And he said, you're gonna be out of here by Saturday. So I walked over to him and I had a big fork in my hand. I was flying pork chops. He backed off a little bit. And I looked up and I said, look, mister, there's four, day, four doors in this house. You can take either one of them. I says, but I would take the one on your right. He says, are you throwing me out? I says, you got it. I says, and by the way, you tell Art Hogan, don't send a boy to do a man's job, okay? If it weren't for the Dutras who, who said we have rights, nobody else would have awakened to that, to that idea. They were really hard fighters. They, they didn't want to leave and, and they, uh, they held out to the very end. And, really fought for what they believed. They were the last ones to go. I was sneaky like they were. I moved out of that house, I left my blinds up, I left them half open, and I, and I moved. And there was several days before they knew they moved when I was out of there. By the end of May 1968, not even the Dutra Ponderosa was standing. 
It took 10 years, but the old neighborhood had finally fallen. Did the city lose part of its historic character because this was demolition versus uh, rehabilitation? Sure. But I think that the decision and the tools that were in the toolbox in 1960s and late 50s uh, are different than the tools in today's toolboxes. The tools in the toolbox had in fact changed by 1982. Specifically, two blocks south of the renewal area, the Battery Street Historic District was formed. Ironically, the buildings in this area were similar in style, age, and condition to those in the renewal area. But instead of tearing these buildings down, the state offered a 25% tax credit to owners of income-producing properties who rehabilitated their buildings. This shift in city planning philosophy came 14 years too late for the residents of the Champlain Street Urban Renewal Project. I can't take my children back and show them where I lived, where I grew up. Uh, that's a hurt. For anybody uh, who spends their childhood in a specific area, you always look back and hope to see it someday as you grow older, and that's not the case for myself and many others. Well, I just look at it and think, geez, I used to live there and now it's the most valuable land in town. <laughs> this project helped to solidify this downtown. It taught a lot of us what was needed to make a downtown work. It has been an educational process for two or three generations now. It took a long time to get to this point and to measure 30 years from when it, it started, it, it wasn't a benefit to the city. A lot of those homes that were destroyed could be landmarks. Do you know what I say? They paved paradise and made it a parking lot. 